Um, so welcome everyone. Um, prior to the uh, session, just uh, a bit of an uh, inquiry. Uh, uh, last week I asked you to set up, uh, uh, to, to um, commit to uh, oral presentation so slots. And I know that there's a bit of a conflict with the uh, mobile course for selected, for, for some of you uh, really. Um, and in this slide, I just wanted to assess as to whether uh, it would be more convenient for you, the ones that are um, have committed to Wednesday in particular, because that's where uh, I understand the mobile um, course assessment would be, to switch to a Monday session instead. Is that something that people would be comfortable with or would that be conflicting? Or elsewhere or otherwise? Feel free to um, speak up or use the chat or whatever else we have really. Uh, it would be, good, would be good to know so I can uh, negotiate somewhat with uh, both uh, Marius as well as um, to see you know how we make the best use for our, our participants really because we are the larger group so we have a slightly bit more of a um, you know uh, restrictions in terms of the uh, flexibility at which we can run those uh, oral exams. So it was related to the um, Wednesday the 13th of May 2020 and the question is there uh, is it possible to shift this to the 11th for those um, that are affected whereas the Tuesday the 12th of May will stay as it is either way so anyone who has committed to that date uh, they'll be safe uh, well safe um, they, they um, can just uh, um, stick to that date and I'm just interested to see whether there's a um, challenge there if I don't get a response, I will just post an issue on the issue tracker and hope that people comment on this so I can um, uh, assess whether it's it's easy to shift. But even now or later throughout the presentation, feel free to um, you know um, add, add your comments into the chat or the likes so would be quite helpful. So far, I don't hear any comment or feedback good all right um well um this week is is uh, the second last presentation session actually really um and that's actually quite uh, yeah we're getting closer to to the end i realize a bit of a uh, pity i must admit but um, that's pretty much how it is but uh, remember that um while the official um lecture time frame ends end of this week so meaning this is, would be the official last session we in serious games have an, an additional session next week right so in masters course we often uh, run a bit more extended uh, um, the time frame but it's not a significant extension so basically um just next monday is still a session and i've seen quite evident in fact before the current group um, uh, Wilde has already posted the uh, paper we are going to review then uh, in the uh, in, in, in this um, news uh, game session on the uh, 4th of May. So just to keep an eye on it and be aware of this, uh, please show up for this session. It's uh, very important as well. Uh, and it's part, part of the course, of course. So um, without much more further ado, and now I see we are 20 people. It's actually really nice to see that everyone is uh, uh, committed to showing up here. Um, I'll um, well hand over, I believe, to Akif, Salman, and Rutkur um, to present um, their work or the, the, their overview on science education before we turn then to their uh, paper for discussion later. So um, the floor is yours. Um, okay. Um, can you hear me? Right. Yes, I can hear you at least. Yes. But... Okay. Um, this one my hand. Okay, um, okay, um, we were a group of three people, Akif Kadoos, Salman Khan, and Uktaf. So our topic was science education, and we did a paper, we did, uh, we prepared a presentation on a studying participation in a citizen, in a citizen science game about IY. So, um, so yeah, next slide. So first I will give you a brief, um, short introduction about some Mm, basic topics so we can start science education science education is about teaching science to school children and and non-scientists and the gaming industry has played a major role in its spread by producing some games which have science education in it science education cultivates student curiosity about the world and enhances scientific thinking 
through the inquiry process student will recognize the nature of science and develop scientific knowledge and science process skills to help them evaluate the impact of scientific and technological development during their life next slide um yes now i will talk about a little bit about serious game the primary serious purposes can be teach or train in areas such as education healthcare advertisement and politics serious gaming is the use of games to fill needs other than just entertainment serious games are also called applied applied games and this concept of gaming is used by a lot of parts of the industries like defense health emergency management scientific exploration and education a lot of industry uses serious game to teach stu um, students even adults different ty types of skills and to help them gain knowledge by also having fun next slide okay science education in serious game as we know video gaming is one of the biggest industry in the world right now the time and effort put in by the gamers is very high and in the modern world where technology improves improves every aspect of in every industry including gaming and education it is it is very good to know that science education is also improving under its shadow and it is linking um it is trying to link its um by teaching science education to people by gaming and they have invented a lot of games which are helping um, children to understand about science education next slide now um, i will um, talk about some games which um, which are made for specially for kids to learn about science like uh, on the top um, left corner there is a game which name is melting point in this game um, children are are supposed to learn and the melting points and the boiling point the cooling points and the boiling points of different objects in the center you can see an object if we we can select there are like 500 objects we just put one object in the center and then from the heat we keep pressing heat until it boils and the boiling boiling temperature will be shown on the screen so they can learn how to and what's the boiling point for example of a can or of water same goes for the cooling points as well on the bottom left corner there is a game in which kids learn how how plants are grown um they try to give uh, water and sun sunshine to the plant and as the plant grow they they keep need, they need to keep pressing the water button or the heat button so they need to give the right amount of water and sunshine so the plant will grow um, perfectly so if they don't then the plant will not grow so through these small games um, kids are to, um, serious uh, serious game is trying to help them also enjoy the game and also learn something about science how these things are built now i will talk next slide yes and so this this was the game that we focused on um, mostly as uh, the um, let me give you a brief um, history about this um, the human brain has roughly 80 billion neurons connected with million of miles of axon and dendrites in our brain so it's no surprise that the neuroscientists are only starting to understand how the brain is wired um, neurons are mini skill and so researchers researchers are trying are utilizing a new imaging technique to map their connectivity even so it takes a neuroscientist 10 of hours to construct a single cell so to increase the pace of this thing a uh, um, a sion lab formerly at massachusetts institute of technology now known as princeton university created a game known as iwire to um, iwire to crowd source data analysis of brain neuro neurons using an online game so iwire uh, iwire was created in 2012 and iwire utilizes something more intelligent than even the most powerful supercomputer has the human brain people can uh, as we know people can still do a lot of things better than supercomputer like uh, recognizing patterns and 
so this game is online and we can think of this game is like coloring a coloring a book um remember um, how as a kid we were taught to color within the lines this is pretty much the same but instead players are tasked with the assignment of mapping out neurons from one side of a cube to another by scrolling up and down through the cube and rebuilding neurons in its segment next slide these were the main points that we covered in the paper um the motivation of participation in iwi and identification of 18 motivations of engagement and participation in iwi and how these relate to specific platform features such as gamification and communication and collaboration that's great so this is uh, how the game is played so this is basically the main interference of the game in which uh, there are two and which there are two two boxes um in the in the le left side there is a cube in which uh, uh, a neuron in the brain is shown and in the left side uh, in the right side we need to find the missing pieces and as we click on the uh, on the right pieces the the branches will start to extend on the left side next page as when we have clicked all on the pieces then we need to just select from um, there's a button in on the underneath which i will explain better when i will show you the video that uh, we need to press the button to see how much of the puzzles we have got in right and it will then show us that you like it showing that you have got 95% correct and uh, then we will move to the next part of the game next one now there's a video demo which uh, i will explain Do you want to explain what's happening on the video while uh, this playing? Because I, I think it's largely a tutorial at this stage. Is it correct? Um, yes, um, I'm just waiting for it. Uh, actually, um, this is an online game, so Aki, um, can you stop, stop it? So um, this is an online game, and uh, you can just sign up by using your username with your Facebook. And when the game interferes, game. um comes before this screen there's another screen on where when the game interferes come you can we can see the neuron rotating in the middle and there's a there's chat option in the left hand corner we can zo zoom in the neuron there and see and see, see the neuron which is um, trying to be researched by scientists from different angles so and then there's a button to start the game then we just press the start button and then this screen arrives now aki can you continue the video so um the uh, on the left side there and this is a interference cube which is the volume of the real brain and the neuron brain that is growing through it so one by one so um the so uh, we actually have to map that branch seen in the blue so whenever we, uh, on the right side whenever we find the right piece it will um, the, and it will start to branch on the left side 
we have to create we have to when we find some volume it will be added to the branch uh, on the left side and this is actually a piece of the neuron branch so as we keep finding the pieces on the right hand side it will map in the left left hand side in the cube so we have to continue to find all the pieces until all the branches are complete to the edge of the cube and uh, and uh, we have to look for the jagged edges because the neurons are smooth on the edges when uh, so li like this on the left hand side uh, on the right hand side whenever we find the right piece the left hand side will continue be piece together and we need to find all the parts until the edges of both are joined so right now he's trying to find the pieces whenever we find the right piece it will be either green or blue and whenever the um, on the right hand side it shows the red um, the background is red then it means that this is not the right piece and in uh, and the progress will be shown on the progress bar we can anytime just stop it and to see and see how much of the work we have done Okay, I'll give you can stop the video. So um, when when we have um, pressed the button to check our um, how much uh, process was done correctly, then we are rewarded points on how much time it took and how much volume um, you found and uh, how much other players agree with that. And you will then move on to the next cube. Um, on this game, we can also select different 3D neurons that have already been completed and research is being done on them. So we can zoom in and zoom out of them to see how it is mapped inside our brain. And we can also chat with other, other players and uh, you can check any player's profile and to see how much points they have generated and how much accuracy, how much accuracy they have in finding all the pieces. And we can also get different kind of badges and achievements through this game. So we um, there's also a board, a board in which after every week positions are updated. Um, pe people in ranked in the top hundred get uh, different types of badges, which helps them a lot. And uh, we can and the and the top players spend like thirty to forty hours in this game in a week. Now, Akif Kadush will continue. Um, <clears throat> yes. So, uh, just a quick question: Like, how many of you have actually played this game already, or you know about this game? Um, just to have a rough idea, if you can just raise your hand if you have played this game. Uh, okay, I guess nobody has. So um, there are two questions. Uh, they might be confusing at this stage because we uh, have not played this game, but uh, just to get an idea that, for example, as you all have seen uh, that how this game is played. Uh, so if you play this iWire um, for more than one hour per week, so, so how long do you think you would be playing uh, this game, like what would be the rough estimate in hours? Okay. Uh, two hours maybe right okay then 
there is another question that do you think uh, this game like iwa inspire you to learn more about the brain like not just this game or maybe uh, some game like this which you have played uh, do these kind of game inspire you to learn more about brain or like to learn more about something okay so i have two yes and one no okay so okay let's move on to the the paper which um which we have read and um which we are presenting right now so as salman told that the main uh, points covered in the topics um were actually they studied the motivation factors that why participants actually play this game why they are participate participating in this project and then they identified the biggest 18 motivation factor that what are those factors that motivating players or the participants to play this game and then they map those uh, motivation factor to different gamification elements of this project for example communication and collaboration so this is the overview data like uh, it was taken in 2013 uh, at that time there were total of almost 98000 players and out of that uh, there was uh, 80, almost 87000 um, players that only uh, worked on the task they did not do chatting with the other players at all and then there was almost 11000 players who worked on the task but also uh, did chatting they also talked with the other players to discuss the solution and uh, only 1060 players who were very active uh, with the within while playing this game so that is almost like 1% of the total participants who actively played this games uh, and then there are some statistics about games and chat messages how many chat messages were there and then average number of tasks uh, per player and then average number of um, uh, hours uh, which are spent by each player um, then we have as you can see those are divided into task the players which uh, only spend time on solving tasks and also who spend time on tasks as well as uh, talking to the other participants okay so uh, coming towards the survey data uh, the survey was ran during april and received uh, 1505 responses in total and the participants were asked uh, some demographic information such as age uh, gender education geographic location and then they were given the option uh, to write about anything uh, what they want regarding the motivations in playing iy so they were not given uh, predefined options uh, in the motivation field but they were free to write anything uh, they want so these were actually the survey questions for example why do you play i by and it was a free text question no predefined options were given and participants were allowed to write anything about their um, about their motivation of playing this game uh, then the gender again it was a free text response age uh, players were given numerical choice country it was a predefined list of the countries uh again level of education it was a predefined list uh, occupation again uh, was a pretext uh then there were some questions about the timing uh, like how long do you play i y per week uh just a rough estimate it has also predefined options then if you play i y for more than 1 hour per week how long do you play rough estimate so again it was a free a free text uh when we'll go to the results um, we will see how, uh, what kind of responses we got 
and then does iwa inspire you to learn more about the pain it was uh, also a predefined options okay so in the method uh, what they did is they analyzed the responses uh, using a technique called uh, thematic coding so which is actually um, a kind of a qualitative analysis and what it does is uh, it involves recording or identifying passage of text or images that are linked by a common theme or idea and the most important thing uh, in this technique is it allows you uh, you to index the text into categories and we establish a framework of ideas uh, from it uh, moreover it is uh, essential to view the text in a theoretical or analytical way uh, rather than merely approaching it with a descriptive focus uh, obviously in this kind of process intensive reading needs to take place during this process to ensure that you are able to identify all of the relevant ideas in the text uh, including uh, even the most simple so uh, this is kind of a uh, complex technique so i'll try to explain it with uh, an example for example uh, this is a take this is example is taken from uh, the study about the carers for people with dementia so these guys actually interviewed people who are uh, taking care of uh, maybe their spouses or their parents who are suffering from dementia so uh, this question was asked from berry and the interviewer just asked one question to berry which was how you had to give up anything have you had to give up anything uh, anything up that you enjoyed doing that was important to you so this is how he replies um, i have uh break uh, broken down the response into eight sentences <clears throat> and this is how the response goes uh he says well the only thing that we have really given up is well we used to go dancing well she can't do it now so i have to go on my own and then he continues that that's the only thing really and then we used to go indoor bowling at the sports center but of course that's gone by the board now so we don't go there but i managed to get her down to works club just down the road on the occasional saturdays on the, to the dances uh she will sit and listen to the music like stay a couple of hours and then she she is had enough and then if it's a nice weekend i take her take her out in the car so what we will do right now is we will try to find uh quotes from this passage <clears throat> so from sentence number 2 what do you think is the one word uh, looking at the question the question was what have you given up so from the sentence 2 what do you think is the one word we can take out that uh, reflects that what he has given up in his life now well um i um, i guess we should want anyone else to answer but uh i think it would be great if anyone would re respond i mean i have my intuitions and i suspect uh ak if you do as well <laughs> uh, yes uh, but anyone else perhaps uh the thing uh, the question is uh, from sentence number 2 uh what is the one thing we can what is the one word that we can take out that the question was uh that what berry has given up so from this sentence number 2 what is the one word that we can take out that we know that he has now given up he doesn't do that anymore just from sentence number 2 yes that's correct so he has given up the dancing so we can take that one word uh out uh then moving on to the sentence number 3 that's the only thing really and then we used to go indoor bowling bowling so what do you think uh 
Shweta is the one word we can take out from this sentence that he has given up and he is not doing it anymore. Yes, so it is uh, indoor bowling. Uh, then moving on at the sports center, but of course that's gone by the board. Then we have another uh, set of sentences, five and six. We don't go there, but I managed to get her down to works club. Just sit, just down the road on the occasional Saturdays to the dances. She will sit. So what do you think we can take out from these two sentences that uh, Barry is doing now? Like we know he has given up on dancing and indoor bowling, but uh, he is saying that he has started to do something else. So what do you think is that now? What is the one or two words that we can take out from these two sentences? If anyone can guess or if anyone has idea. Uh, maybe a little bit, I don't know. No, okay. Um, well, now what he does is he dances at the work club, yes. Okay, then just the last two sentences and listen to the music like they like stay a couple of hours and then she's had enough. And then if it's a nice weekend, I take her out in, in the car. So what do you think uh, we can take out something that he is doing new uh, now? Um, no, that's just actually a reflection. No, it's not music. Well, the thing is, they also drive together because he says that if it's a nice weekend, I take her out in, in the car. So what we can see is that we can extract is now they also drive together occasionally. So what we can extract out from this one response is the factors or the things that participants have given up is one is dancing and the other is indoor bowling. Obviously this is just, uh, th that was a response from just one participant, but if we apply the same techniques to the response from multiple uh, participants, that's how we can build up a list. And what does the participants do now? Uh, they they do dancing at the work club and they also drive together. So this is just one uh, example of how this uh, technique actually works. So now they, this is uh, a response, the actual response that one of the actual response that they got from the participants uh, from who are playing iWire and it goes like it is the question was why do you play iWire? Like what is the motivation? And this is how uh, one of the participants responded that it is easy to access when you have a few minutes to kill and it is more productive than doing nothing. Moreover, it allows you to contribute to a project while learning and testing your own brain. So what do you think if we analyzed uh, one or two motivation factors, like one or two uh, words from this whole, what could be those words or word uh, from this response. Like why this particular participant is playing iWire. Uh, if anyone have any idea. Uh, you can see one of the factor could be as it says that it's easy to access plus 
the situation is when you are trying to kill the time you are bored and you don't want to do anything difficult so maybe a laziness factor is involved and um, then uh, it also says that it allows to contribute to a project so what we can extract the like the primary motivation factor is the procrastination that this participant plays i by when he does not want to do anything else and he does not have anything else to do he is bored and he does not want to put any effort uh, to do certain work so he he play i by just to kill the time and if we talk about taking the secondary motivation factor then that could be that he also wants to contribute to a project so this is the technique that they applied to the free text responses uh, which were received from the survey participants okay so talking about the methods as i explained uh, thematic coding in detail what they did is they applied this technique to the free text responses and the important thing to notice is uh, they said that we do appreciate the literature review work but they did this thematic coding uh, before reviewing any existing studies okay uh, isn't this more of an example of time killer than active procrastination it could be but this example is actually taken directly from the paper that they, this is uh, how they um, they did the thematic coding this is how they extracted the words so this example is exactly taken from the paper so that was the response and this is what they got out of it so they put this response in in the category of procrastination okay so um but they applied the thematic they did not uh, study any existing uh, literature they did not do any literature review because uh, they said they were afraid that they might become biased in uh, in extracting the words so they did this analysis before uh, doing the literature review and then they carried out there were total of three researchers and they did the analysis in four steps uh, in first step what they did is they simply extracted the words they did the coding individually and then they discussed it with each other to to uh, extract a combined list of words or list of quotes and then in the second step they actually refined uh, the list of quotes that was extracted in the first step so first two steps were carried out before doing the literature review in the third step they compared their list of quotes with the existing studies uh, means they did the literature review they study the um, uh, papers which were like similar studies which were carried out earlier and then they compared the results uh, with their own result that they uh, extracted from the thematic coding analysis and in the fourth step they map those responses and they they map those responses to the survey like demographic uh, demographic data of the of the participants uh, one important point uh, to remember here is that was the survey representatives as they said uh, the responses uh, like the survey participants were almost or roughly 10% of the total players who are playing uh, this game i by so for example if they say <clears throat> that 50% in the survey they found out that the 50% of the participants are male and 50% of the female so they were not sure if that is the actual reflection of the male or female ratio i'm just giving one example of the gender there are other examples as well so they were not sure that those 10% who participate in the survey is reflecting the actual um, span of people who are playing the game so they were given uh, an access to anonymous data set of the actual players who are who were playing the i wire so <clears throat> uh, it was uh, again it was written that it was anonymous uh, that they did not know the actual names of the player 
but they did get the information like demographic and they were also had access to the analytics software which was being used uh, in the iwire so then they compared uh, their results uh, especially kind of uh, demographic factors they compared it their um, data set results with the data set anonymous data set that they were given and they found out that they were almost uh, the same not exactly but almost the same so they can validate their results based on the results of their survey so moving towards the results um it this is just an overview that there were 38% of female and 62% of male and total participants from uh, the number of countries were a total of 96 which is quite a serious number who are playing this game and in females there were almost 60% of the participants who play iwi for more than 1 hour and in males participant there are almost 54% of the player who play iWire for more than one hour. Um, just another overview of the result, it is the education level. As you can see, uh, the education, like the average age of the middle school was 17.5 um, years old. And then there are two categories for high school. For example, there are high school students who are currently studying. Their average age was almost 17 years old. But there were also people who are playing iWire uh, whose education level is high school, but they are not studying anymore. So obviously they were older. So their average age was 32 years old. And then same um, categories are created in college which are currently studying and which are not currently studying. It was again 40, uh, 22 and 40 years old respectively. And then uh, similarly, we, we can see about the finished college, like who have finished the undergraduate. They, are, they have completed undergraduate, but they are not studying anymore. And then the graduate school who are currently doing the PhDs. And then they are graduate school who are currently doing masters. The one interesting thing that we can do here is, for example, the students who are the participants who are currently doing PhD are on average are younger than those who are currently doing masters. So what we can find, uh, what we can extract from this is that the the current master students are actually who are playing this game has actually uh, had had a study gap maybe they worked in the industry or something else so they had a study gap they are older than those who are currently doing the phd so um then we have the master's students who have completed their degree and the average age was uh 47 years old and then we had the phd uh it was 59 uh Another interesting fact that we can see that the the range of the age is quite wide. For example, as we can see in the middle school, we have uh, an average age of 16.7. And the oldest person <clears throat> in the PhD category is 59. So all we have, we had people from almost the age of 16 to 60 who are playing this game. And uh, there were also people who are medical doctors that are also uh, playing the game. Uh, just a quick overview of the participation from, uh, seems to me to an error for PhD. Uh, well, it could be, yeah, maybe. But as I said, these are the facts directly taken from the paper, so it they could be in they could be incorrect. As they said that there were only ten percent of the actual participants who who were playing the who were playing the game. Fifty nine is the average, not the old uh, oldest. Fifty nine is the average, so obviously there could be uh, older people as well. Okay, um, country participation, as you can see, most of the participants from USA, 
it was like 47.23 percent and then germany five percent canada uk poland and then australia and we can see that the obviously the biggest participation was from usa but also the the secondary participation from from either the european countries or like australia and we cannot see any countries from south asia or or from some eastern countries like in the top um, in the top participation of the countries okay so the motivation analysis uh, these are the definition like when they extracted the words what was the actual definition that they follow for example when they when they uh, extracted the word contribution what they meant was that contributing to the project not specifically related to helping science and when they extracted the word science it was like help helping improve improving scientific knowledge direct mention of contributing to science and then third biggest motivation factor was fun like for the entertainment value no specific mention of games or competition or anything and then the fourth was learning that they want to learn about science <clears throat> or related uh, learning purpose and then there are other factors as well for example personal interest interesting procrastination relaxing and gaming and puzzle challenge and so on and then we have the total number of occurrences as well for example contribution was the biggest factor and it occurred 286 uh, times and out of 286 165 times it was occurred as the primary factor of motivation like primary motivation factor and 121 times it occurred as the secondary motivation factor and similarly uh, the second biggest was science so again it was primary and secondary 188 and 74 and so on it was it has also been divided into uh, male and female uh, for example if you see the second to last addictive like the addictive nature of the task often describing their flow or finding it difficult to stop just three uh, just six occurrences and none of the male participants actually said that we are playing this game because we are uh, actually addictive to to this game and then again there was interface and competition and uh, other factors like that so in the next step what they did is they combined uh, those factors in primary and secondary uh so if they after doing the pairing for example they paired contribution and fun and they found out that this pair occurred 50 times in uh, in total and then when they paired fun and science that was the that pair occurred total of 38 times and then there are other uh, pair as well for example contribution and personal interest contribution and gaming fun and learning and then contribution and relaxing contribution and procrastination as, as, as the contribution is being used um, several times because that was actually the biggest motivation factor so that's how they paired it uh, then there's motivation illustration according to the uh, education level for example for middle and high school we can see that the biggest uh, the primary motivation factor was fun and the secondary was science and those who are who have finished high school as we could say they were uh, older in age their primary motivation factor was competition and then fun and um, then there is uh, again college degree they were more interested in curious they were curious and then science and then finished uh who have finished the college degree that was contribution and science so as you can see there is a difference from middle school to the graduate school in the middle school the biggest motivation was factor was fun and when you get older maybe this is how the mindset works you the fun changes to contribution you are more interested in contribution and but the secondary factor remained the same they were all of these were interested in science and for the phd who have uh, completed their degrees apparently they were not so much interested in science but they were more interested in fun and but 
but they also wanted to contribute uh, to the project and then uh, talking about the mds and dos they were only interested in uh, contributing the, to the project and they want some relaxing experience um, while contributing to something useful okay so next is uh, oscar will explain the discussions that um, the researchers did uh, on the results they found out uh, hello everyone uh, should we take a break or sh do you want me to continue very good question yes who wants a break i see some uh, coffee cups here yeah the coffee cups are mounting oops a lot of yeah. coffee cups yeah we don't have a choice so thanks for following up on this one so when should we continue 15 past i don't hear any no's well so far 15 past probably that's that's probably sensitive it gives us nine minutes for a breather and then we continue from there on cool so we do that so let's reconvene at 15 past and continue there So, I think we should just continue the way I see it. Yep. Uh, yep. yep. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my my teammates uh, Salman and Akif uh, introduced you. Uh, what game is it? How research was conducted? Uh, in my part, I will try to explain a bit of kind of uh, why uh, some things are done and like why questions, and some a bit of analysis. So, um, first of all, uh, the, uh, probably you know the uh, web-based uh, science, uh, citizen science project uh, is like mainly uh, done for the uh, reason of like uh, avoid the difficult, uh, computationally difficult and time-consuming tasks and give the tasks to the people so that they will make like they will work on that task and like save time and like uh, make it better than the uh, computer can do so in example of this a wire uh, you, you you can understand that uh, they try to uh, map the human brain uh, uh, with the here like other community or citizens help because the other solutions like uh, machine learning or deep learning were probably too much uh, complex or too much time consuming. So the authors of that paper uh, consider uh, Airwire as a successful project uh, who managed to create like successful uh, citizen science uh, uh, game. And so uh, if we discuss, uh, and, and in this paper, they, they, they really want to discuss why they were successful and why the people uh, kept, uh, playing that game and contributing to the science at the same time. Uh, one of the things was uh, they, they come up, uh, the gamification elements. So uh, the, the, they, they had a, the true sources of information, they had the surveys and they had the chat data. So according to them, the gamification uh, elements uh, 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 was kind of also motivating for them and keeping them uh, to participate in this game uh, because uh, in some of the surveys they told like internal rewards uh, or uh, entertainment like beautiful or like kind of uh, the animation or the, the uh, user interface was really interesting so that they wanted to continue and, and the third thing was uh, uh, they, they, they had a, a chance to compete and gain the status uh, like they had a leaderboard with the scores and badges and they, they could see the, the, the how, how how many points they have and how many badges they have and they had some kind of uh, ranking so this this was the, the the main gamification elements they used in the air wire so uh, please next so uh, the second thing uh, they found that um, what was like kind of motivating or uh, uh, reason for success was the uh, scientific contribution. Uh, let's say anybody uh, who really uh, like kind of uh, wants to know about the brain 
uh, neurons or any like amateur scientists or maybe the PhD uh, brain biologist or someone really wanted to uh, make a scientific contribution. That's why they maybe uh, kept uh, playing that game and uh, the drawing, uh, mapping the uh, brain cells. So, so the second reason is like uh, probably the human nature of uh, helping for uh, to other people even if for example i'm not a scientist or i'm not a brain enthusiast uh maybe i uh, some 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 of the guy like me played just to help to that scientists uh to reach some kind of uh, boundary or so, some kind of uh, valuable information yep next please yeah and the third thing was of course uh, uh about learning uh they uh, the, the the everyone who who played the game uh, in most of the survey uh, res, uh, most of the survey responders uh, answered they they wanted to learn more about the brain it, uh, like uh, just just uh, that kind of uh, brought them to the to this game and uh, uh, and uh, it, these people was from the young to the old ages uh, which means like uh, maybe young people was mostly in, interested in extrinsic rewards like uh, ranking and leaderboards but the probably the old people tried to keep uh, the, the they had a intrinsic uh, like kind of motivation intrinsic desire or intrinsic rewards uh, to play this game so the in the air wire they 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 managed to balance uh, this uh, uh, two things so yep uh, and next yeah and the uh, third uh, uh, mo one of the most important things uh, was uh, uh, c community engagement uh, so uh, uh, if we if we just imagine that uh, one of the uh, phd student who is uh, uh, researching on a brain and uh, like just sitting somewhere and like he is kind of in the really 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 specific topic uh, probably is as a human we, we can understand it's kind of maybe boring a little bit being alone and without any community so the third thing really uh, attracted people uh, according to the story was that they feel they uh, they are in some kind of uh, community with uh, like-minded individuals and they, uh, in the, in the uh, application they had a, a chat uh, chat chatting and uh, according to the that chat data uh, the, the uh, researchers found out that players who chatted with each other they completed more games and they they, they were more like uh, motivated and they, they they were able to share that experience and everything but main thing for them probably was like community and like like i had that there is other people like me who are doing same things and they understand me or something like this yep next please so uh now um if you're gonna reflect or find the uh, limitations of this uh, paper uh the we, we will have to um kind of uh, a bit kind of try to uh, analyze what they had and what they didn't have so uh in the reflection part uh they tried to mention what methods and what findings they had and how they they are uh, correlated so uh according to the survey again uh, uh the main uh, desire uh, or main motivation of the people was like helping a worthy cause uh, learning about the science more and third was just killing the time just uh, don't spend it uh, for free or something and yeah uh, uh how they how they uh uh what methods they 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 use it uh to get this data and analyze, they they took a survey, uh, which is uh, uh, kind of uh, maybe uh, uh, not the best, but a good uh, way of uh, getting people's opinion. And they had uh, also second thing, uh, they, they had uh, the data analysis of the system. 
logs like they, they had a chat data and uh, the, the, that a wire uh, platform data uh, w where they tried to uh, find the patterns of the users like maybe one phd guy or one the young people uh, like they tried to uh, track that so yeah and uh, next slide and uh, next page please yeah and what what uh, what could be the worse uh, to uh, mention is that they had a, a geographical bias uh, as akif uh, showed you statistics uh, you have seen that a lot of countries like united states canada uh, germany italy uh, netherlands uh, australia or or other uh, kind of western countries mostly and they they have they don't really have uh, people part participated from the uh, probably the Asian or African countries, uh, yeah, and the, 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 that would be uh, the, that would be kind of a, a difficulty to generalize the uh, uh, some uh, ideas. So, uh, and the, the second thing, uh, which, the second question uh, would be uh, on this uh, research. Uh, uh, is is it uh, good? Uh, the, is the findings or the what they uh, the, their conclusions or like small uh, deci decisions uh, are good enough uh, for the uh, designing uh, guidelines of uh, like online communities uh, like Airwire did? Like I don't know the online communities of uh, 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 dental hygiene people, let's say, or some kind of. Uh, uh, healthcare related people is is it good enough for this and uh, the one of the uh, like most important question probably here is is this um, uh, findings and methods are uh, like good enough for gen, gen, gen uh, for their generalizability like can we generalize out of this about something so it's uh, they the, they didn't uh, they didn't uh, actually generalize but but they just uh, uh, mostly researched on the air wire. So and next, please. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, for the conclusion. So uh, they they tried to research on the player engagement and sustained participation, and uh, uh, they got uh, data uh, uh, data from the online survey. Uh, like asking why the, do you play airwire like just general and they they got the gender age uh, education level and everything and the second thing they got was the data sets uh, from the airwire web, web platform uh, of uh, three years yeah three years uh, of data platform and uh, next so uh, they uh, kind of uh, shortlisted the, these four things as a main motivation uh, like main uh, main uh, what people uh, uh, like felt when when they wanted to play uh, this game first of course the, the de uh, desire to contribute uh, to the science and the project second is the just uh, self-learning uh, interesting uh, in, they're interested in the brain and third is the community belonging and the, fur, the last one was just entertainment of because of that uh, gamification so yep next please so okay um that they, they had the two sources of data they had a, a data from the survey they had the data from the chat data so and uh, what they got from survey was uh, they like kind of uh, tried uh, they kind of found out the main reasons as i as i said what motivation or what uh, what what people felt uh, when they played the game uh, of these three reasons like aiding the beneficial cause advancing knowledge uh, scientific knowledge and learning and from the chat data uh, the, 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 they found that uh, found out that they people really use these three things like uh, they they used game comments, uh, self performance, and leaderboard monitoring uh, features a lot. So this this is what they found uh, found out. Yep. And next, please. So the, as a, as a future work, uh, the the authors stated that. Uh, it's it's still not enough uh, uh, gen generalizable um, findings and methods 
for understanding the citizen science. So there, there is a lot uh, more work uh, needs to be done for this. And uh, the, the, the next thing they pointed out was like, they got the data, uh, they had one question in the survey, like why the, uh, why do you play air wire? That's it, like they didn't have any like, uh, how to say the reasoning questions, uh, other than that, they asked uh, how long can you play this game and like education and age and gender, but uh, they, they understood that the, in the survey it needs to be, uh, uh, asked more specific and more uh, exact questions. So th this is what, what they felt and what they stated. And uh, okay, next step of the uh, this research, uh, they uh, they think uh, uh, they just got the one uh, moment of the air wire, but uh, they didn't have a long time analysis of the that uh, pop, uh, like that community of the air wire. So they, they, they thought that it would be a really great idea to have a lo like a lo longitudinal study of the players, not only at the one time. So, and the, the next thing would, the, they, they saw like they, they need more, um, uh, need to uh, more deeply analyze the specific uh, platform features. Uh, as I said, uh, chat, uh, chat, chatbot or uh, leaderboards or uh, these uh, uh, badges or like why, why that features are, are being used and uh, like how they are related to other stuff. So they need to research on that more. Yeah, uh, next. Yeah, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask, please. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for the presentation. It was uh, fairly comprehensive, uh, covering both the topic uh, uh, more generally and then the paper more specifically, pretty much doing what the discussion point of the um, um, paper was about. Um, in, in, in fact, uh, ju just one feedback on the more general part initially, um, uh, it, it was very tailored around this paper, right? So. Um, we, we didn't really see a more general introduction into science education and the role serious games can play therein. Uh, that's something that could have been played up quite a bit because there are different disciplines, um, you know, in biology, chemistry, physics, and so on, in which um, serious games have, uh, have been applied w with mixed success, of course. Uh, but that would be quite in, would have been quite interesting to see. So it, it would relate to this one. So, um, but I think it shows a different pathway of taking this paper really apart and kind of to, trying to dissect it and making this subject to discussion. But anyway, that's something I just wanted to give as more immediate feedback. But um, since we're in the discussion mode of the paper, uh, if does anyone is anyone willing to make any comments on the paper or thoughts they had when reading the paper? Good, bad, or ugly, as usual. Yeah, uh, well, I, I believe um, Utkobek or uh, Akif would moderate it, but Runa raises his hand, so I believe maybe. Yeah, I, I, I hope you hear me. Yes. Um, I, I, I think I pointed out in the chat already a couple of points that and I, I'm always skeptical when papers like this show some level of what I consider inaccuracies. Uh, so one is the average. How could the average be higher than the two numbers that you try to average, even if it's a weighted one? Uh, and the other is the uh, the encoding of that very phrase. So if you go to page four, so what what they are saying is, it is easy to access when you have a few minutes to kill, and it is more productive than doing nothing. Now, if you look at the definition of procrastination, it says to avoid doing another task. So I mean, if you do nothing, then you are not avoiding doing other tasks. And also they say it allows you to contribute to a project while learning and testing your brain. So that seems to me to be more, should be coded more with, uh, with uh, contributions and challenge and not procrastination. Um, yes, I believe so. When we were actually uh, preparing the presentation, 
uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, so when we were actually presentation, when we came to this specific point, we also uh, came up with the same idea, like how how come ex this could be procrastination exactly? So we also the first thing which we came up with that the biggest factor could be the contribution. Uh, but as we were supposed to actually uh, represent the paper here, so that's why I. Um, that's why I put the actual word that they extracted from it, and it was actually the procrastination. So, sure, but but when we're reviewing the quality of the paper, I think it's uh, when when you see inaccuracies, and I I don't believe they talked about the. Uh, I, I probably maybe didn't see it, but I didn't say so much about the inter-rater reliability either, did I? So I mean, in in this type of encoding, it's very important if you get to trust the results. We need to to make sure that they did the very best in interpreting and, and, and coding. And they were multiple, they say they were multiple, but I don't know if they said anything about uh, how much these coders agreed to make sure that the encoding was indeed, number one, what the codes were, and number two, the how the codes were applied. Because that, as we can see, it, it becomes quite crucial in these type of studies. Uh, yeah, you're right. But uh, there was no detail that what was the what was their process of actually agreeing on the code. As they just mentioned in the first step, they just did the coding independently and then they discussed their code to make a unified list. And then in the step two, they actually just refined the list. And in the third step, they compared it with the existing studies. So they did not mention any further. Exactly, and I think uh, it, good studies in, in using this methodology would disclose a little bit more about how much they agreed and, and how they went forward to guarantee the quality of the, the qualitative encoding. Yeah. Well, mostly since there are accepted uh, levels of uh, intercoder reliability agreement, right? So like values like 80% or uh, higher, because if you don't, then it probably means that your coding is ill uh, specified, meaning that their, their approach, their methodological uh, guidance uh, has not been properly developed. Um, so that's kind of the expectation that uh, un underlies this. Um, so anyway, I just for barging in, yeah. Um, the, the what happens in practice i mean i have partake uh, uh, participated in such meetings what happens if you discuss something in a group there's always a bit of a group dynamic happening and you have this risk of groupthink so if someone suggests something uh, for whatever reasons others may be inclined based on seniority or any other factors may be inclined to agree to a choice of terms perspectives or interpretation without thinking independently anymore and this is really the risk of those uh, uh, informal settings in which people agree on coding so um, uh, yeah so anyway just as an appendix absolutely right any other comments I, if not, I mean, I can, I don't see any fingers or hands or, or is there other hands? No, it's clapping, good. Um, they, um, uh, and one other comment that I uh, find is a, a, a bit challenging. Um, um, so the, 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 the um, listing of the, I always struggle a bit with education levels as an uh, assessment pattern, or of course you can do those assessments, but education levels are not linear um, because um, education levels uh, um, describe a certain focus on specialization that are much better captured by occupation. Um, so the, uh, well, they, are, they report, not, you know, they report systematically uh, which age levels of the, uh, with respective education levels contribute to this particular uh, project and partake in it. Um, it would be much more accurate to, to see what the background of those individuals is. I mean, you guys uh, uh, took, an, took, an, took a step towards interpretation and suggested, okay, there may have been students that have, been, have, in, have had intermittent work, work experience and therefore we have a higher age average uh, for master students or completed master students uh, that part, uh, participate. But generally, uh, the more you progress in your studies, the more focused and um, specialized your interests and also your expertise becomes. And I think this could be uh, reflected in the skew um, 
um, um, um, of individuals of certain specialization participating in this kind of project and perhaps others not. So the interaction between the occupation fundamentally or even the discipline of study probably uh, and, and, and uh, participation in this project would be pr probably quite important to identify as well. Not just saying, you know, you have a master's or PhD because it doesn't really help you if it's in a totally different area. So merely the uh, alluding to the uh, education level is probably not, not enough. There's probably something more underlying in this structure that may be more indicative of your participation. Meaning, for example, you have a, let's say, science-based education or, uh, you know, whatever interest you have taken and uh, path you have taken may give you more than just bluntly looking at education levels. So it's one aspect to it. Um, and the only other aspect that um, is would probably um, be Rune's standard attack point is that um, the study doesn't really report our standard deviations again, right? So we only see averages, and there's something there that could be explored as well. Average really tell only tell you so much. Um, only in conjunction with the standard deviation do they actually make really uh, give you a real insight into what the structure of the, um, the response is in this setting, right? That's, those are two more like on the shortcomings uh, perspective that I had. Uh, any other comments in this similar direction? No, I don't hear anything. Um, if I may make another point, Akif, would go back, don't know. If yeah, you mean, uh, can we say our, our like our personal reflection about this paper? <laughs> They, they, that is that is of course when I, yeah if you want to have some further reflections um, yeah please go for it for example I don't know um, yeah yeah I believe about the questions they asked and the, the information they took uh, from survey responders is not enough to kind of make a decision or like get some analysis from this as they have only one they had only one question and uh, I don't know like. Uh, uh, personally, I thought the game is kind of boring for the other uh, scientists people, for example, who are not interested in the brain. The game, uh, like, kind of not uh, kind of really engaging. But yeah, but they still were successful in their own specific uh, area. Mm. Yeah, this is, this is probably what yeah. I felt, what I thought, yeah. Mm. One thing that they did good is that um, they are trying to figure out how the brain is working. So they knew that in the university they had limited number of people uh, who could have problem explode, with microphones. Uh, explore this. So they made a game of this and they put it online so that uh, all the people in the world. Mm, you couldn't hear me? Somewhat, but um, uh, very um, delayed, a bit of a, yeah. Uh, I don't know that, maybe my internet. Okay, is... it's better now. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I, was, uh, I was saying that the one thing they did good is that um, they knew they had limited number of people working in the university. So to just try to do this themselves, so to figure out how the brain works and try to complete the mapping would have taken a lot of a lot of time and it would not have been possible because it takes a lot of time so they did a good thing that they made a game of this and they put it online so that uh, all the people in the world can try to help them because what, what, whenever we complete some um, um, levels in this game all the data and goes back to those scientists and then they can look at what we discover and that they try to um, use that data in their research so um, this is helping them as well so this was the purpose of this game I think right that's a good point um yeah, yeah any other comments on on this so perhaps just in some injection and more a question to um, you guys that have read the paper, analyzed it a bit and looked at the uh, chosen method. So this thematic coding approach, 
uh, it's it's quite um, uh, seems quite worthwhile. But what would have I mean? Um, it, it 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 seems quite laborious as well. On the other hand, to do the analysis, but also kind of error prone, I suspect, because we saw it already when we labeled the example, or you guys really nicely actually labeled the example uh, and had us participate in, in helping to decode it. We'll see that we saw already that there's kind of a bit of a di divergence. So it's not as unambiguous as one may think in terms of the encoding, what's actually relevant, what's the core content and so on. Um, combining this um, and, 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 and allowing the validation there of um, with some sort of um, perhaps sentiment analysis, right? So or alternative um, um, analytical approaches um, um, such as perhaps topic modeling, which could be part automated. Um, may render a, a, either an alternative for the encoding and in its entirety, but also could have rendered a um, complementary validation effort. So instead of um, um, vali validating everything by hand, uh, let alone the lack of the reliability, inter-rater uh, reliability studies, um, it could have helped first the automating um, uh, some of the aspects, but second, secondly, perhaps also reduce the risk of mischaracterizing um, certain uh, uh, given content. I mean, we can't assess this right now at face value, but I'm just wondering if there could have been an, a, a richer ca um, uh, consideration of alternative techniques for, for the assessment, right? Simply having me talk about a topic mm -hmm. does not really tell as to whether I agree or disagree and so on. Is, I'm not sure if there any intuition on your part or something in the paper I have overread on this. Um, there were few things that, for example, uh, there was, I, I guess, uh, the numbers that do not make sense. For example, uh, in the in the total number of players, they were almost 97, 98,000. And then they said the total pass participants in the survey were 1,500, 5, maybe like 1,500 something. But the responses that they on which they applied the inductive them uh, thematic coding analysis, those were total of 989. So there is a chance or maybe something that even the 1500 participants who um, who took the survey did not answer the free text question completely. Mm. So th that was one thing as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's a challenging one. And uh, again, they uh, like it seemed that uh, since they applied the manual approach, they did not apply. Uh, they did not apply any automatic approach. And it seemed from the tone that they actually uh, take it as a strength of their paper. Like they did not take any chance with the AI or anything, and so they did it all the work manually. Uh, but the, the one thing they mentioned that the researchers for all four steps remained the same. Like it did not happen that three researchers did the first step, then the, some other three researchers did the second step. The researchers were same in all four steps. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah, I, I think just following up on the... Uh, running large uh, questionnaires or studies where you use encoding or qualitative data. I, I think it's, uh, to me, it's it's more fruitful to run smaller studies to try to identify what is a interesting coding. And when you have decided that, you can run a larger study and ask the uh, users to point out which of these categories apply. Uh, so, uh, I mean, of course, you need to formulate it differently than just the, the keywords that are there, but, but uh, I find it useful to, sometimes you don't know what mm. could be relevant factors, so you may want and may need to run a, a qualitative study to, to find what the codes could be, but then when you would like to analyze, you would like to make sure that you get the properly interpreted responses, and then you may rather go with uh, with uh, which of these uh, would you agree with the uh, very motivation for you to do this? And then you can get a, a more accurate, even though there is still, there is a, the, the uh, pe people who are responding still need to interpret your, your uh, text. So there may still be a little bit of, uh, of uh, misclassification there as well. But it, I, I think it's, uh, if you have, as, as Christopher was saying, when you have uh, 
lots of responses, it's very time consuming, even though there are tools that will help you do that. It's very time consuming to encode and, and it's more risky that you will uh, encode it uh, in, the, in the wrong way. So, so I think that using the qualitative study on the smaller population and get to understand what the codes could be and then run the larger quantitative studies is, is probably the more used approach and, and is probably more successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be very useful and uh, time saving as well. That we can get an idea uh, from the smaller group and then we can move out to the larger group. So maybe we can do analysis using an automatic uh, automated approach for larger groups. I think this insight that uh, Runa just shared is, is, is uh, beyond the paper. It's really important for you guys, right? Because many of yeah. you will do some sort of user testing, right? In many cases, you can uh, quantify outcomes. I mean, I'm talking specifically about, you know, program performance and, and the usual studies. But beyond this, uh, especially if you're more user centric, and that applies, of course, much more uh, for the interaction design uh, uh, masters, but, but also for the max masters, then you need to think about how to assess and uh, code. Um, the the the, the uh, qualitative data right so runa alluded to the kind of the construct development that you that you need to entertain and thinking about the staged approach whatever the size and sample that you actually get in the end it's a different question but simply devising and developing the method uh, thoroughly is really really important because just having a large number of participants doesn't necessarily mean much so that's kind of the the, the lesson learned from uh, from there right so because if you just get the wrong uh, uh, uh wrong kind of data wrong kind or limited information then you lose out of, on a lot of opportunities and a examiner will pick, pick up on this realistically so um, that's just something to take away for everyone um, any other comment from the quorum Runa, by the way, listed the folded initiative currently uh, ongoing. It's probably quite timely if you want to. Uh, I need to choose my words wisely now. I uh, there's yeah either to, to kill time or to procrastinate. So you need to identify first which ones of the two you do before you engage in it. But nevertheless, have a look at it. Uh, perhaps it's something you can participate on uh, 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 right now, which is of course much more um, uh, fitting to our current uh, challenge. So the folded folded uh, initiative has been. Uh, Kind of reinvigorated, if you like, uh, to contribute to uh, learning more about the coronavirus at the current stage. So it's quite similar in its in its uh, approach. I'm wondering if anyone is doing research on this as well. That could be quite interesting. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm quite I sure that in two years you're going to see lots of papers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. I know one guy who did the web project for the, for the coronavirus. Uh, I don't know, did he do any research or something? Yeah. Web project? What does that, uh, yeah. I, just to contextualize it a bit. I don't it's know. A, um, a project for the, the volunteers and the t t testing tools. Uh, it's like just a platform like announcement. One host, like in Germany, he, he studies in Germany, uh, a lot of hospitals, uh, probably they don't have a unique website to uh, say about the testing and volunteers like you know these two uh, reasons so they usually what the uh, like doctors do is they say okay we need the uh, 10,000 testing tools and uh, maybe some people want to help to the hospitals the, uh, the, as a volunteer they can just uh, announce I want to help or something like this is just a website for this mm. cool that sounds uh, like a promising avenue. Interesting. Okay. I mean, you guys are, can all, are also free to think about the kind of directions you want to take your, your master's in this current situation. Yeah, I have a question about master's thesis. Can I ask now or it's out, like it's related to the this uh, paper? Um, yeah, if there's no other yeah, objection, yeah. then go for it. Yeah, yeah let's uh, uh, imagine one scenario like uh, some student wants to research on the virtual reality in education and uh, created uh, one uh, game uh, for the mobile uh, 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 mobile phones and uh, the, uh, the game has like 50,000 people 
uh, downloaded it, but the game has like 5,000 active users. And uh, if, if that uh, student get the survey from these 5,000 people, maybe they, he will or she will get a response from maybe, I don't know, 1,000 or less than 1,000. Uh, what if it, uh, they do the numerical analysis uh, or, uh, that from that people like 1,000 or I don't know, 900 or 800 people, and then bring it, uh, bring a kind of a bit uh, analysis to the uh, topic of virtual reality in education. Is it good enough? And is this numerical, uh, is these numbers like under thousand uh, responders good enough for numerical analysis? Well, it ultimately depends on the, the user base, right? So it's relative to the user base and how far it's re representative for it. So you wouldn't just be able to um, generalize it. So if you, for example, have a 1 billion user and you do a uh, survey amongst 1,000 uh, users, that's probably by no means representative. So that's, that's a bit this one. But numerical analysis, that's the question. What does it actually entail? I mean, what are you collecting? I, you know, so that, there is a bit of a question there. Yeah, maybe it's something similar to this uh, paper. Like, why, uh, why are you interested in playing this game? What's your motivations? And like, why do you think, uh, like, let's say the game is for children, why do you think, uh, why do you want to, uh, do you want your children to play this game or like some, some kind of, uh, how to say, maybe a little bit of motivation or maybe a little bit of uh, uh, population's opinion, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, sure. So, I mean, that's that's definitely a sensible approach if uh, if you develop it systematically. But uh, the way it sounds, I mean, at least from the explanation right now, that the, uh, this this study would be by no means only quantitative, right? It also has a very strong qualitative, meaning non-numerical uh, component as well, right? So uh, it sounds yeah. more like that you need to entertain uh, text processing in, in some way or another, be it, for example, thematic coding, topic modeling. Um, um, sentiment analysis or whatever else comes across your way, right? So that could be a sensible approach. I mean, it, it sounds like it, it being clearly in the scope of a typical master thesis would entertain, um, uh, but it needs to, you know, on the developmental side or in any case on the analytical side, have characteristics that justify, uh, um, um, you know, um, master's level evaluation and analysis. So, yeah, so it really boils down to the specific subject case basis, but fundamentally that is a possible pathway, yes. Perhaps Rune has some complimentary. Yeah. So it's oh, okay. No. Don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah. So you mean it's good to analyze the the survey responders from that app? Like it's good enough for the master's thesis, right? Like well, the question I think is, that, yeah, if, if I may ask, uh, yeah. answer. I think the best thing is to. Uh, get in touch with whoever will be the supervisor and then you mm. work out the details. I think what Christopher is saying is that it may or may not, it depends on how it's scoped, how it's framed, how it's set up. And the best way to move forward is to, to work with the prospective supervisor. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In the end, everything is on the case by case basis, right? It needs to have certain requirements and you probably want to also be involved in the development to some extent, right? Since it's- Yeah, something. yeah, definitely. So, yeah, yeah. No, but talk to you, uh, try to find out a super, uh, find a supervisor whom you can, who would be interested in supervising it, but also just interested to discuss it in the first place. Perhaps uh, you can draw some inspiration from there. Um, yeah. Yep, yep, thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. Any other comments regarding any of what we talked about today? Or well, rather what uh, um, 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 Akif, uh, Quebec and uh, Salman talked about today? Um, no, that's pretty much from my side. From your side, you're good, okay. But yes. may, maybe a, a meta meta comment from my side. So, so I think Christopher and I, we are, we are paid to be critical. So, so when we uh, when we uh, when you pick papers, we are by definition critical, and that's not because these are necessarily uh, bad or weak papers. I mean, papers they have been published, been reviewed, and been considered good enough for publication. And and very often, or always, when you do a project, you have limited resources, and if you had more resources, you could always do better. So so, but the thing for us, uh, I think. Uh, one of the reasons we are a bit critical is to try to make sure that you are not blindly 
accepting everything you read and think since it's published, it's all just good. Because as you can see, it has strengths and weaknesses. There are all the things that we could point out that could have been done better and there are things to, even though they claim that, okay, this is an example of procrastination, we could say, hmm, I'm not so sure. Since you show me the, the results and show me how you define procrastination, I'm not so sure, which, uh, which is a kind of critical reflection, critical reading skills we, we would like to instill on you. So, so we are probably, uh, or I am at least, uh, much more focusing on the, the weak aspects of the papers than the strong aspects of the papers. And you are quite good at uh, picking up the strong side. So, so I think we're trying to balance in and trying to help you develop that uh, eye for, for critical reading. Is that right, Christopher? Absolutely, uh, of course. I mean, uh, and again, this whole session is always about feedback that you can inject and introduce into your report as well, right? So we can actually reassess your critical but also appreciative view uh, in your very report where you discuss the paper at greater depth. Yeah, so it's essentially, it's absolutely right. Um, but it's also is important to know because we are brushing over a lot of different disciplines, right? So we have um, 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 some, some qualitative uh, methods that we probably have never heard about. So in this slide, thank you very much for introducing us explicitly to thematic coding. I don't think that has been covered in any other course to, to date. I, I can't speak for MIX in particular, but uh, at least in, in, uh, in the MIX area, I'm not sure if that's covered. Is it covered in the scientific methodology? So no. Um, but um, um, this exposure uh, requires that you're also acquainted with those mechanisms, but also sufficiently critical. And um, this is something you want to take away here as well. Uh, yeah, well, in the, the method was not explained, like this specific thematic coding method was not explained in the paper. So they just said that we have used this technique. It, it's often, this is interesting. Um, you're right, you're absolutely right. But we, we don't know enough because it may be a disciplinary bias. So if you, for example, publish in certain venues, right, as a web science, conference 2016 or something like this, it may, may well be a commonly used approach, right? If you, uh, if you for example, publishing in an economics value, you don't need to uh, introduce the idea of general equilibrium model because everyone knows what that is. If you publish in another area with, where this is rather remotely used or not used at all, you probably need to lend a section to this or describing at least or paragraph to describing what this is all about. And I have the impression that uh, thematic coding seems to be pretty much embedded within that community. So, uh, I mean, that, don't take my word for it, but but that's that's my intuition, the way uh, it's written in the paper, that it's kind of a, everyone knows what it is anyway, but I need to make reference to it. Therefore, they have the two many, many tool references for it and uh, are covered basically, right? So there's also something you want to be uh, aware about. And sometimes it just sits outside of our community. If we, for example, you were to do that in your master thesis, we would very much expect you to explain a bit about this uh, approach a bit more than those did, right? So not just having a reference to it, but actually briefly running us through how it actually works um, as well. So it's something that's uh, worthwhile highlighting. So thank you very much for picking this uh, up on this. That's actually very, uh, very important. There are always some biases sometimes, yeah. Good. No more comments so far, I think. Uh, I don't see any line up there. So um, I think we can conclude this session by uh, thanking our presenters. So thank you very much for preparing this and uh, um, um, uh, running this in this way and choosing a paper and so on. That's really helpful. I hope you got some feedback for your actual review yourself. Um, and um, the um, next point that I want to remind you of, remember that next week we have uh, another session. Don't get um, uh, carried away and believe this would be not the last session. Uh, you are mistaken. So there is another session next Monday. Does it coincide with any holiday by any chance? I just learned that Friday is actually a holiday. Um, you notice since, um, <clears throat> no, since, since this whole uh, work from home situation, I have become rather ignorant about uh, um, the uh, weekend and uh, weekday cycles. Uh, still commit to the day and night cycles. That's quite sensible, I guess, but uh, it could well be September at this stage and no one would really know, wouldn't it? So um, hence uh, my reminder. So next week we still have another session. So please, please join us uh, for that one as well. Um, Good. Any other comment, question? Okay. I sense not. So um, thank you very much again and um, hope to see you next week. That would be good.
you that's a quite nice one the rooster sounds healthy that's always a good one yeah um i'm not sure whose rooster it was but it's a healthy one that's uh, very helpful um yeah that's the perks when you are living in the countryside <laughs> yeah Oh, they're interested in the rooster's name. That's an interesting problem as well. Yeah, so uh, sure, that's a feature of the countryside. It's beautiful. You, yes. you know, in my country, there is one uh, proverb or something when the rooster uh, the shouts when it's not the time to wake up, you should yeah. kill that rooster. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, to be, to, honestly, we have that kind of proverb, you know, like you should kill the <laughs> okay, I I strongly I, I assume all of you are residing in Norway right now, right currently, and if you are, I strongly advise you not to follow this uh, advice. Um, Runa has an injection here. Perhaps he has a more refined perspective. Yes, on and especially if the rooster, um, if you have rooster in homes on the request of children. So my niece really likes these kind of birds. So I cannot even think of doing that. I, I just wanted to say that I hope there are some hens with the rooster so that they get some <laughs> eggs for the the extra noise. <laughs> that's right. And yeah, if not even off, offspring, yeah, that's right. Good. Uh, so keep clear of roosters, but don't do anything to them. Um, anything else? No, I think we're good. I don't see any further voices. So we let you go. Thank you very much for the presentation and uh, see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.